good to see you this morning. Uh, my name is Josh, one of the pastors here, and we are in week two of a series we are calling Liberate, because we are looking at the book of Galatians, and we're, it is showing us, and we're discovering that Christ has liberated us from the grip of sin to walk by the Spirit. And it's something that every single one of us need to hear and live out. So I am so excited for this series. And one of the things that I think is cool that we're doing is out of four chunks of this series, we have a Bible verse, a memory verse that we're going to remember as a congregation. We're going to memorize it. You'll see it on the screen. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 16a. So if we could read it out loud together two times to help us uh, better uh, memorize it. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, one more time. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Excellent. And Chad talked about last week. If we understand that, if we memorize that and live that out, it'll help us to be gospel wise and we won't be gospel gullible by being pulled away from all these false gospels. Well, today we're looking at a really large chunk of the book of Galatians. What's going on here is the Apostle Paul has written us his personal testimony or his conversion story or his spiritual journey or his new life story, whatever you want to call it, it's the way God has encountered Paul and the way Paul has grown after his, his salvation through Jesus Christ. So it's a really lengthy section, but as we look at it, we will see four truths about the gospel that are so important for us to know. And I've actually invited a friend, Shola, uh, up. He, is, uh, he has a much better reading voice than I do. And so he's going to read uh, this section of scripture for us. He and, uh, he and his family are such a vital part of our church family. Amen. We're reading from Galatians chapter 1, from verse 11 to the end, and 2, 1 to 10. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. But I receive it through revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among many people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to, to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned to Damascus. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you, before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still on no impost to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. The holy were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. Chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with, with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seems influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or I had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. 
Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to, to, in to, to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seems influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I have been entrusted with the gospel of the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who walked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, walked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seems to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Amen. So here's Paul's testimony, his conversion story that he's sharing with us. And he spends almost a third of the book of Galatians sharing with us this story. Why? <laughs> I thought we talked about last week that the gospel was all about Jesus. Why is Paul going on and on about his own story? Well, what Paul is saying, and you, we will see as we look close, more closely to his testimony, he's saying this, my life is evidence that the gospel I shared with you, that the gospel, it is trustworthy. My life is evidence that the gospel is trustworthy. Paul's life is living proof of the strength, the power, and the purity of the gospel that we will see in the rest of the book of Galatians. Paul's not saying he's perfect. He's not saying he himself is trustworthy by anything of his own ability or his own strength. Rather, his life is proof. It's, it's an illustration. It's a result of the truth of the gospel. Paul's saying this, the gospel is trustworthy and my life and your life can illustrate that. But you know what? The gospel is still trustworthy even when we're not. That's what Paul is sharing with us because a testimony, a new life story, a conversion story is not a story about how awesome I am, it's how awesome God is. It's not a story about how faithful we are, it's how faithful God is. It's not about how we found God, rather, it's how God found us. Let me try to illustrate it with this chair. Um, my wife and myself and my children went to uh, visit my parents in Canada and we drove through Detroit and went to Ikea. So here is a rock solid Ikea chair, 20 bucks. So I built this chair and it's solid. I mean, you know, we had a bunch of stuff in my Ikea. Like, it's good stuff, you know. It's solid chair. I can, I'm, I can tell you, it's, it's got the screws in there. All, everything's together. It fits. It's a solid chair. And I'll show you. I'll sit down in the chair and show you. Look, it's a solid chair. It can hold my weight. Probably hold your weight. I can stand on this chair. It's pretty solid. What Paul is saying in his testimony is this. The gospel is the chair. It is trustworthy. It is reliable. I experience its trustworthiness and its reliability. You see, I'm not, see, when I sit on this chair and tell you that the chair is reliable and trustworthy, I'm not telling you that I'm trustworthy. I can fall off this chair. I almost did a few minutes ago, right? I'm not telling you that I could be a chair somehow and like hold you up if you came and sat on me. Rather, what I'm saying is, what Paul is saying in his, in his testimony, 
is that the gospel is trustworthy and his life bears out that truth. You see, too often I hear Christians share with me that they're uh, afraid or unwilling or ashamed to share with others their personal testimony. You see, they say, you know, I I'm not at the level I feel like I should be in my own spiritual development. So if I share my testimony with my coworkers, my neighbors, my family, they'll look at my life and think, well, that guy, it didn't work for him. What the apostle Paul is trying to say, and what I want you to hear is this, the gospel is not about you. Your testimony, it's not about you. It's about God, God's work in our lives. So that means we can readily admit that we fail, we sin, and we often fall, even though God has always been faithful to us. You see, sometimes people are even encouraged when maybe you're up, maybe you're very spiritual mature, maybe people think you walk on water. Well, when we're honest and open about our struggles in our lives, sometimes that gives people a little bit of relatability to realize, oh, you deal with that too, and I deal with that. Christ saved, can save you, he saved you, he could save me. That's why Paul spent so much time talking about his old story because he testifies that the gospel is trustworthy even when we are not. Well, as we look at Paul's testimony, we see four truths that play out about the gospel. The first truth is this, that the gospel is for man, not from man, or for humanity, not from humanity. Chapter one, verse 11 says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. You see, the true gospel is not something that somebody just made up. Pastor Chad talked last week about all these false gospels. He talked about eight of them. We posted a list of 13 false gospels on our website. Talk about the gospel of religion, gospel of materialism, the gospel of achievement. All of these gospels are false gospels because they add something to Jesus. See, the gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. And if you put anything on that side of the equation other than Jesus Christ, it's a false gospel. You know, all those false gospels Paul, Chad talked about, you know what they all have in common? They were made up by somebody. Rather, a religious somebody, a business somebody, a political somebody, they were all made up. And that's why if you pursue any of those false gospels, they will leave you empty, alone, and abandoned because there only, there's only one God who, as Scripture says, sticks closer than a brother. That's why it's so important that the gospel that the Apostle Paul is sharing through his testimony and the gospel that we teach through scripture is pure. It is accurate because it is a matter of life and death. Philip Ryken, president of Wheaton College says, the gospel is not man's good news about God. Rather, it is God's good news for man. The gospel is the message saying that we are not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we, through Jesus, not through our own ability, our own capacity, our own goodness, we, through Jesus, have been liberated from the grip of sin to walk by the Spirit. That's the message of the gospel. And we see that played out in Paul's testimony. The second truth we see is that the gospel is received, not achieved. It's received, not achieved. See, the Apostle Paul, he ex had two formative experiences in his life. One was his upbringing and education. See, the Apostle Paul grew up in a very religious home. He went to the parochial school, K through 12. And then after that, he went to the best seminary in the entire region. And he was one of the few top students in the entire faith of Judaism. He was 
the cream of the crop. And not only was he really smart, but he also was zealous. He was passionate about following the old Jewish customs. So his whole life is based on living according to this idea that God's love is earned. If I do this, if I, if I keep these laws, if I am this way, if I do the right thing, if I know all these Bible verses, all of this theology, then I can be right with God. He believed before his, uh, the second experience that the gospel is achieved, not received. But we see in Acts 9 that Paul was on his way to go imprison a bunch of Christians that Jesus showed up. In an incredible encounter, Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said, basically, cut it out, Paul. You're fighting against me. And from that moment on, Paul moved from a Christian persecutor to a Christian missionary. From an enemy of God to a friend of God. He moved from seeing the love of God as something achieved to as something received. You see, that happens in every one of our lives. Maybe you grew up in a very religious home and you believed that God's love was based on something that you could do. Or maybe you grew up in a home that didn't, well, it's not religious, but your father's approval was based on your grades or your performance on the ball field or your appearance. Every one of us has some type of achievement desire uh, ingrained in our lives. We think certainly someone has to love me based on uh, what I can do, or what I can give them, not on simply the character of that person. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died to show us that the gospel is simply received. It's not achieved because we couldn't achieve it. Of all the people in all the world, Paul would be like a top candidate to, be, to have achieved God's love. But Paul himself said, I was the chief among sinners. You know what that means? That means the root of sin is trying to achieve God's love. But true love we see in Jesus Christ, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and offers to us salvation and forgiveness. And it's a gift. It's not something I earn, it's something I receive. Today when I get home, I don't know this for sure, probably my three-year-old son has scribbled something on a piece of paper and my wife Deborah probably said, happy Father's Day written on the top. I didn't earn that, right? I didn't like all the hard work as being a dad, of all the diapers and all the finances. You don't earn that, but you receive that. It's kind of that way with God on the flip side. What are we gonna give God to earn his love for us? some scribbles on a piece of paper. No, no, God so wanted us to believe and understand and receive his love that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. I'm telling you, if you believe that the gospel is something you have to earn, I don't think you still understand the depth of God's love for you. And you need to believe today that justification, being right with God, happens not through works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that was the, that's the second uh, truth we see out of Paul's testimony. The third truth is this about the gospel. The gospel is Jesus-centered, not culture-centered. And we see that through verse 18 to verse 6. Scripture tells us that Paul received Jesus through that unique revelation. Then he began to be mentored by a man named Barnabas. And a few years later, Paul took a guy named Titus under his wing. Titus was actually a non-Jew. He was what they call a Gentile. And the, this, uh, for about 14 years, Paul and Barnabas and Titus were ministering and sharing the good news of the gospel with non-Jews, with Gentiles. And what they decided to do, they go, you know, we're experiencing some really great success throughout the Gentile world and people receiving the gospel. 
we've heard there's been some trouble in Jerusalem. There's been some persecution and some um, uh, people dying for their faith. Let's go up to the church in Jerusalem, kind of have a powwow, and make sure we're teaching the exact same gospel. So they go up to the Christian leaders in Jerusalem, uh, Peter, you know, one of the apostles, James, the brother of Jesus, and John. They all get together. And they say, this is what we've been set, telling people about the gospel. And then, you know, Peter, James, and John, and this is what we've been telling people about the gospel. And you know what they found? They're all teaching the same thing, the exact same thing, even though there are two different cultural expressions of the gospel. And, and in, Jerus in Jerusalem, there were a group called Judaizers that said that, you know, in order to be saved, you have Jesus plus circumcision. It was a and very, very important Jewish religious rite. But everyone said, no, 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 the gospel equals Jesus plus nothing. And what we see, Paul saying, look, Titus, Titus was a Greek, he was not a Jew, you didn't force him to be circumcised because we were all teaching the same gospel, that the gospel is Jesus plus nothing. And what Paul is doing, he's making the point and reminding the church in, Galatia, in the Galatian area that the gospel is about Jesus. It is centered on Jesus. It's not about a culture. It's not about a specific way of living or a specific country. It's about Jesus Christ. See, back then, the big deal was circumcision. Well, you gotta be circumcised to be saved. No, 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 you don't. You don't, a Greek doesn't have to become Jewish. But today, we don't deal with circumcision, but we do have our prejudices and preferences. There's nothing wrong with having a preference on music, on clothing style, on speech, or whatever, but it is against the gospel, and it is against the work of Christ to raise our cultural preferences above Jesus. You see, in the end, when Christ comes again, we see in the book of Revelation that the he heaven looks like this, a big city with a bunch of diverse people with different languages, different clothes, different hairstyles, different hair textures, all different people, all worshiping Jesus Christ together. See, that's the direction, that's the trajectory that God is working in our world. So we actually work against him when we try to make our culture the most important thing whether that's our preferences about how we sing, what we look like, our political perspective, our um, uh, identity in our, our country. The only thing that needs to change about a person to become a Christian is their heart. Everything else they can keep. And we want them to keep. We don't want people to become uh, homogenous because that's not what... Christ has set out in the new heavens and the new earth. See, we have a group of people from our church in Pearl Island, and our hope is that people in Pearl Island who've never heard the gospel will hear the message of Jesus, put their faith and trust in Jesus, their hearts will change, but we don't want their language to change, we don't want what they eat to change, we don't want their clothing to change, because we want them to be able to share the gospel with their neighbors who are just like them. You see, that is so important that we keep Jesus as the center of the gospel and we keep our cultural preferences much further below in order to participate and put our shoulder into the plow of what God's doing in the world through his son, Jesus. You see, sociologists have noted, non-Christian sociologists have seen that Christianity is the only religion that has changed cultural centers. So, a Buddhism. It always has been and still primarily Southeast Asian. Hinduism, it still is and primarily on the Indian subcontinent. Islam, it's, it always has been and still is centered on the Arabian Peninsula. And actually in order to be right with Allah, you have to actually go there at least once in your life. And true uh, devout Muslims only read the Quran, only read the Quran in Arabic. But see, Christianity is different. Christianity moves to wherever Jesus is moving. And we see in the first 100 years of our faith is that it was centered in Israel. That was the center. And, but 
Following that, another 300 years, it moved to North Africa in the Middle East. Following that period, it moved to Eastern Europe. And after that, it moved over to Western Europe in the British Isles. And now this kind of the cultural center of Christianity is in the West, in the, uh, Western Europe, and especially North America. But we see that's changing. We see a major growth, an explosion of followers of Jesus in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in South Korea, and in China. And you know what? We're excited about that. We're excited to see how that culture will greater reflect the beauty of Jesus Christ, as well as us Americans, as we see less and less people interested in the message of the gospel. We hold the tide. We continue to fight back the darkness knowing that we have the light of the gospel. But the good news is that the gospel is Jesus-centered, not culture-centered. All right, the fourth truth we see from Paul's testimony about the gospel is this. The gospel is a team sport, not a one-man show. Now, we in Cleveland uh, recognize and appreciate this principle, I think, more than many. Uh, because we, unless you're Jesus Christ, you're going to need a whole team to succeed. You know what I'm saying? So, we, but we see this in Paul's testimony. You see, as, as the, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas and Titus got together with Peter, James, and John, they shared, hey, we're all in this together. This is one gospel. But what they did, we see in verse 9. And when uh, James, Cephas, which is just another name for Peter, John, who seemed to be pillars perceived the grace, the gospel message that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, meaning the Jews. So what this means is they say, hey, we all teach the same gospel, but let's go play different positions on this field. We're gonna go to the Greeks, we're gonna go to the Gentiles, we're gonna go to the Romans, you guys stay with the Jewish people and the Jewish diaspora throughout the region, right? You be a wide receiver, I'll be a fullback. You be a point guard, I'll be a center. But we're all on the same team moving behind our team captain, right? Which is Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but CVC, I love our church. So thankful to be part of our church, but it's not the only church in town. There are so many, dozens and dozens of wonderful, Jesus-centered, Bible-centered church within a 20-minute drive from this location. And we're so thankful for that because every church has a unique DNA, a unique cultural expression. And they're able to reach people that we here at 77 Wallings could not reach. So though I might not necessarily be part of a church that has a different type of Uh, worship expression or length of service or whatever, I'm so thankful for them and you should be thankful for them because they're reaching people with the gospel that we could not reach. You see, Peter, James, and John extended a right hand of fellowship. That means we're partnering together with those churches and we here at CVC do the same for all those faith families that follow Christ. All right, well, let's pivot a little bit toward application and that one nugget I want you guys to remember. I think the biggest thing, as I was looking through and studying this passage, is I would love for you to remember this chair illustration. That even when we are not trustworthy, God is trustworthy and his message is trustworthy. So you should be emboldened and be strengthened and be encouraged to share your testimony. Because the good news of the gospel is we're not perfect, but Jesus is. He died on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven. That that means is we could sit firmly on his message, knowing that even when we are weak and broken, he is not. And we could even use where we're at in our lives to point people to Jesus Christ. And you know what? We do that through our testimony. And that's why I want to encourage you as strongly as I can this week, to write out your testimony. 
you'll see on the screen a structure that you can use to write out your testimony. See, before we baptize anyone here, we have them write out their testimony and they share this testimony. I tell you what, it's a major encouragement to me and it's a way to proclaim the gospel message. You see, a testimony goes something like this. There's basically five parts you'll see on the screen. When you write out your testimony, first you wanna look at the good in your past. You know, you wouldn't be here if there wasn't some good in your past. The fact that you're alive is good. You can highlight that. Next, you wanna talk, talk about the sinfulness of your past. This is something you don't need to be get, get into the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty, but talk about those major issues that you struggled with, that you've done that displeased God, that weight and burden of guilt that everyone experiences. Next, explain the gospel message. And you know what? Our memory verse is a great way to do that. Say, you know what? I know I wasn't right with God through works, things I could do, but only through faith in Jesus Christ. Next, Share the circumstances of your conversion. What, what did it feel like? What was going on in your life? Was it, where was the location? What happened? Because sometimes when you experience those feelings, it helps people understand when God is working in their life. And then finally, ch the changes that have occurred after their new life in Christ. This is where I was this and now I'm this. I was broken in this way. Now I am being restored in this way. And I encourage you, Write this in maybe 200 to 600 words. So if you do that, you can simply share it in about a two minute period of time. You're not gonna give someone a lecture, but you give them enough to understand what God has done in your life. You'll see on the screen, I, I wrote mine out. This is my personal testimony. It goes something like this. I grew up in a family that regularly went to church. My parents knew Jesus and told me about Jesus. I was a good kid, I tried to do the right thing, but the Bible says that we are not made right with God because of good things we do, but because of Jesus' death on the cross. One day, I, I was in a children's program at my church, and I felt a strong pull in my heart to give my life to Jesus. After I did, God began working in my life in amazing ways. Though I constantly fail, still do, I know that I am becoming a better father, a better husband, and a better friend. Because of Jesus, I know that I love people more, <laughs> and I'm being changed into someone that strives to do good deeds from the heart. God is making me look more and more like Jesus. What is your spiritual story? See, if you write this out, and you have it in kind of developed in your heart, the next step is to pray that God will give you an opportunity to share this story this week. And I promise you, a room this big, with this many stories of new life in Christ, I promise you that if we all write out our testimony and we all pray that God would give us an opportunity to share this with someone who doesn't know Jesus, I promise you someone will come to faith this week through our community through our church, and you will be the spark that God uses to light their hearts ablaze. Are you willing to maybe be a little uncomfortable? Maybe put yourself out there a little bit to write your testimony and then pray that God gives you an opportunity to share that this week. You know, maybe you've come here with a, maybe with your dad and he asked you to come here uh, to hear someone speak. And maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and you are living your life based on achievement. Well, today I invite you to receive the grace that comes from Jesus Christ, to receive his forgiveness, to receive his love and become a child of God today. You can do that in any form you want. If you feel that pull in your heart, do that today. We'd love to talk with you after the service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We are so thankful for who he is. We thank you that the gospel, the good news is not, a, is not by us, it's for us. Lord, we thank you that it's not about our culture, but it's about your son. It's something that we can receive, we don't achieve it. And Lord, thank you that we can partner with brothers and sisters in Christ as a team to make much of your son. So Lord, help us. Lord, I pray that each one of us writes out their testimony. And we, I pray that we have an opportunity this week to share that testimony 
with someone we work with, with someone in our life house, someone in our family. And Lord, we look forward to hearing about the stories of new life through the work of your son that's playing out in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.